Good morning, Perimeter Church. Good morning. Our scripture today comes from Ephesians 5 and 1 Corinthians 7. <clears throat> Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Now for the matters you wrote about, <clears throat> it is good for a man not to marry. I wish that all men were as I am, but each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I am. But if you do marry, you have not sinned, and if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. <laughs> this is the word of the Lord. <laughs> you know, there's no doubt about it. There are a few verses in the Bible when people hear the verse, they giggle. <laughs> and then that's one of them, right? It's like, oh, man, that's true. So that's part of what we'll talk about today. Uh, let's pray together a prayer of illumination, a sort of new tradition we have here of asking God to illumine our hearts so that we would understand his word. You'll see it here on the screen, and though you're reading it, try best you can to make it a prayer. You're praying to the Lord. Here it is all together. Almighty God and most merciful Father, we humbly submit ourselves and fall down before your majesty, asking you from the bottom of our hearts that the seed of your word now sown among us may take such deep root that neither the burning heat of persecution cause it to wither, nor the thorny cares of this life choke it, but that as seed sown in good ground, it may bring forth thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold as your heavenly wisdom has appointed. Amen. And amen. You know, I love the title of this series, By Design, because it really does bring to our hearts and our thoughts this idea. When it comes to our sexuality, singleness, and marriage, are these things simply cosmic accidents? Are we cosmic accidents? Or is there some meaning to these things? And how do we come up with reasonable ethical standards about all of these things? And as Christians, we do not believe that we or these things are cosmic accidents. We believe in a much more beautiful story, that there's an all-wise and all-loving God, and he has designed these things, and he is good, and he is just, and he has designed them not only for his glory, he has designed them for our good. Today we're looking at God's design for singleness. Before we launch into that, I want to do a little, as brief as I can, sort of a rehearsal of where we've been in the last two weeks. And as I do that, I want to remind you, as uh, Jeff has reminded us the last two weeks, that today you might hear things in the, in the sermon that you would want to cheer or applaud or that you might want to boo or hiss. We ask you not to do any of those, but just to try to hear God's word and to be understanding of others around you that might be struggling as they want to come to understand uh, the word of God and the will of God. Two weeks ago, Caleb started us off in a beautiful and wonderful way as he acknowledged that some in our culture would see the ethical standards of historic Christianity as to be unnecessarily narrow about these things or quaint and outdated or maybe even dangerous. But we think there's a much more beautiful story, and that is this, that there is this good king who has designed these things for us. And the way Caleb put it to us very wisely is this, can we trust God? Can we trust his word? Can we trust his will? Is he wise? Does he have our good at heart? And the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ screams back to us, yes, we can trust God. He who spared not his own son for us, but gave him up for us, can he will, will he not freely give us all good things? And so his will for us in all of these things is good for us. I love the way Dr. Paul Tripp has put it in his morning, his devotional, New Morning Mercies. He has said this, your little kingdom of one cannot compete with the glory of the kingdom of God, which is yours by grace and grace alone. You and I are kingdom oriented. We're always in pursuit of and in service to some kind of kingdom. This ought to be on the screen as I'm reading it. Maybe, maybe they'll catch up. 
you and I are kingdom oriented. We are in pursuit of and in service to some kind of kingdom. We're either living in allegiance to the King of Kings, celebrating our welcome into his kingdom of glory and grace, or we're anointing ourselves as kings and working to set up our own little kingdoms of one. Here's what is important for us to understand. God didn't give us his grace in order to make our little claustrophobic kingdoms of one work, but to invite us to a much, much better kingdom. I would say a bigger and better story. We think we know what is best for us, but we don't. We think we're able to rule our own lives, but we aren't. We set our hearts on things that we think will make us happy, but they won't. We think that we can defend ourselves against temptation, but by ourselves we can't. Every human being is in need of a king. All human beings need the rescue, forgiveness, justice, mercy, and protection that they are unable to give themselves. Very well said. And then last week, uh, Jeff Norris preached basically about this. He tackled some of the toughest issues of our culture today about the good will of God. And he made this very great insight, uh, insightful comment, and this was sort of the, 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 the whole structure of his sermon. That we can either anchor the value of self in the way we feel and the desires we have today, or we can anchor the value of self in something that will never change, that is, that we're made in the image of God. What a great insight, what a great paradigm. Let me give you an analogy. When is a train most free? When it is bounding out through the fields and through the, 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 the forest next to the tracks, or is it most free when it's bounding down in a powerful manner the tracks that are before it? Freedom flows from design. Freedom flows from purpose. And when we are living out God's will for our lives in all of these topics, sexuality, singleness, and marriage, there are three things that happen. First of all, we reflect God as creator. He made us in his image, male and female. Secondly, we are proclaiming and demonstrating the greatest love story of the universe. It is the love story of the universe that a groom came from heaven to seek and to woo and to win a bride. And at great price, he made her beautiful. And now he loves her forever and he loves her deeply and unconditionally. And that is what we proclaim with our marriages according to the scriptures. And then thirdly, there is this. When we're living out the will of God about these things, we are leaning into and becoming a little more aligned with what it means to be a human being. What he designed us to be, fully human, and fully alive. So that's where we've been for the last two weeks. In the next two weeks, we'll talk about God's design for marriage. Today, we're talking about God's design for singleness. Now, right off the bat, let me let you know, I know that those of you who are married might be tempted not to listen. But today's message is for everyone who is married and for everyone who is single. And that's for three reasons. First of all, there's a demographic and relational reason that all of us need to listen. Were you aware that according to the demographics of Metro Atlanta and the state of Georgia as a whole and the US as a whole, that about 50% of those out there who are adults are single, either never married or widowed or divorced, 50%. And that means if we want to love our neighbor and serve our neighbors ourselves, then half the time that's gonna be with someone who is single. We need to learn how to relate and love. Secondly is this, most all of us in this room, almost every one of us will experience singleness at some point of our adulthood. Maybe early in life, maybe late in life, maybe for a long time in the middle of life. It's absolutely unpredictable, you don't know. And then thirdly is this, the Bible talks about singleness. And since the Bible talks about singleness, we need to listen, we need to hear what he says. Let me give you the big idea of today's message. I never want you to miss it. You'll see it here on the screen. It's also on your app, and I'm going to state it negatively and positively, and here it is. We become empty and distraught in whatever condition of life we find ourselves regarding marriage, singleness, and sexuality if we make those things our primary identity, calling, or source of happiness. The point of life is not singleness or marriage. It is to be satisfied with the love of Jesus to live in community with the family of God and to serve God by seeking the good of other people. We wanna look at that main idea under three concepts. 
And those three concepts have a key word, and each key word starts with the letter C, and here they are, calling, community, and contentment. Calling, community, and contentment. And I want to say today to you, whether you're married or you're single, if you lean into what God's word says about these things, you will find deep joy, true purpose, and peace of heart, calling, community, and contentment. Let's dig in. First of all is this calling. Here's the way I would put it. Both marriage and singleness are a gift of God and a calling to an unselfish life of service. Let me say that again if you're a note taker. Both marriage and singleness are a gift of God and a calling to an unselfish life of service. One of the key passages on this whole topic is Matthew chapter 19 verses one through 12. In that passage, Jesus talks about marriage and singleness, and he does so because of a question that is asked of him about divorce. When he talks about God's will as it relates to divorce, his disciples respond and say, well, if it's like that, then it's better for a man not even to be married. And Jesus goes on to say, basically, if I could paraphrase, it's just the same with singleness as it is with marriage. Each is a calling of God. Each is a hard calling of God if you're gonna do it the right way, And in each case, you need the grace of God. It's the same for both. A gift of God, and you need his grace, because there will be challenges in either direction. 1 Corinthians 7, a part of the passage Tom read for us today. If we looked at the whole of the chapter, Paul talks about marriage, divorce, singleness, all kinds of things. But if we had to summarize everything he says about singleness, we could put it this way. In verse one, he says it's good to be single, In verses two through nine, it's a gift to be single. Verses 25 through 31, it's beneficial to be single. And then verses 32 through 35, it's freeing to be single. It's good, it's a gift, it's beneficial, it's freeing. And all of that is around the idea that if you're single, it's a calling of God to make a difference. That's a very, very key concept. Now somebody has said, and others, uh, people have often thought, that in the Bible there's the idea that there is such a thing as a gift of singleness that only a few single people have. And it is true, I think the Bible says, that some intentionally choose singleness as a way of life for the kingdom, I get that. But then others, I think, have looked at this passage and thought, well, some people have the gift of singleness and they can be happy single, and everybody else who's single just has to be unhappy single, because they don't have the gift. I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. I think right here in this passage, And in the other, basically, God's word says, if you are single right now, that is God's gift to you and his calling to you right now. And if you are married right now, that is God's gift to you and his calling to you right now. So it doesn't matter which one is the case. It's a calling, it's a gift, and you need to lean into it as a way of serving. You know, the Bible almost always, when it talks about callings, connects calling with service. And that's what God does about these too. Last week, uh, Jeff quoted several times from Sam Alberry. He's an Anglican minister, middle-aged, single, and expects to be single his own life. He's written a great book called Seven Myths About Singleness. And in that book, he makes these observations. Singleness like marriage is a good thing. It needs to be received appropriately and held in biblical perspective as does does marriage. When we honor it as God intends us to, as a good gift, then we won't presume it needs some spiritual superpower to make it bearable. He also says, the underlying problem is not with singleness but with selfishness. The issue is what singleness is being used for. The issue is not the state of marriage or the state of singleness either one. Both are gifts. The issue is our heart and what is motivating us. The truth of the matter is today that there are some of you here today who are miserable, who are married, and you're miserable in your marriage. My heart goes out to you. I hurt for you. But let me ask you this. Are you using your marriage and leveraging your marriage as a way of serving first your spouse and then serving mankind and serving the kingdom? It's a gift to be used for service. Some of you are single and miserable in that singleness. My heart goes out to you, but let me ask you, are you seeking to leverage that singleness as a way of serving and perhaps doing things for other people 
that Mary's would never have the time or the availability to do. You know, time doesn't even allow us to really tell you the whole story of one person after another in the history of the church that has made a huge, huge difference in the kingdom, people who have been single their whole lives. Let me mention just a few. Augustine, one of the greatest minds of the early church, bishop in North Africa, I think a brilliant, brilliant man, single his whole life. Amy Carmichael, Irish missionary in India, served for 55 years without coming home for a thir furlough, 35 books written. Charles Simeon, 18th century urban missionary in Great Britain. Richard Sibbs, 16th century theologian, writer, scholar, and pastor. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, German theologian, opponent of Adolf Hitler. Corey Ten Boom, survivor of the Holocaust, who then traveled the world in the next several decades preaching about the love of God. Lottie Moon, 19th century missionary to China, who inspired a whole denomination to be committed to world missions. John Stott, who I believe may be the most important influential leader of the 20th century as far as evangelical Christianity. And all those people were single for a lifetime. And if that weren't enough, there's the Apostle Paul. And if that's not good enough, there's the Lord Jesus. Our Lord Jesus, fully God and fully man, lived his life very content, very fulfilled with purpose according to the will of his Father. You know, there are many of you in our church, I have to say this, who were single of a lot of different ages, young, middle-aged, and old, and you are serving sacrificially, you are serving regularly, and I want you to know this, the pastors of our church see you and notice you. You are our heroes, we're aware of how you serve, and we want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. You are examples of what I'm preaching about today, though I couldn't list all of your names. And perhaps if that's not true of you, God may be calling you to join that, that band of people, serving our community, in serving our church in extraordinary ways. So I'm asking you today to take a different view. Singles view your singleness as a calling, a gift to serve. And marrieds, view your marriage as a calling of God, a gift of God, to be used in serving your spouse and then serving the world and serving the church. That's the first C word, the word of calling. Secondly today is the word community, community. Whether single or married, we are to live life in community with the family of God. Here's the truth of the matter. If you've made an idol out of your marriage or your family, you won't really live in community with the people of God. You'll keep everybody at a distance, you'll be all about yourself, and only occasionally check in with the church. It's also true if you're single. If you make an idol out of singleness or an idol out of the marriage you hope to have, there is a great problem in our culture and a great problem in the church of people making an idol out of their marriage and their family. It's taking something that you should love and over-loving it. That's how a lot of idolatries come to be. But God is calling you to live in community whether single or married. Here's the idea of what I'm trying to say. It really isn't good if singles and marrieds are always in their own circles within the church. Certainly people want to have a time to hang out and build relationships with people that have similar and same experiences. But if we're always separate, that's not good. We need each other. Single adults, you need marrieds. Marriage, you need singles. Too often married people in the church hold at a distance those who are single as if they're sort of separate, less than, different. Don't do that, invite them into your lives. And too often singles, don't flex their relational muscles and reach out and invite couples and invite families into their lives and into their homes. Be willing to do that. Why? Because we need each other. Break down those paradigms. And a good example of that in our church is our ministry to 20s. It's not just for singles, it's for marrieds and singles both. A great thing about our City Impact ministry, most of our connect groups, many of our journey groups is that they're a combination of those who are single and married. Let me ask you to think of it this way. If you're single, you have a stake in the health of the marriages of our church. If you're single, you have a stake in the health of the families of our church. See how you might serve. And if you're married, you have a stake in the spiritual health of the singles of our church. 
See how you can build relationships, how you can serve them and love them. Too often, those who are single feel such a great loneliness, they're tempted to compromise God's standards in terms of intimacy. And when they do, sometimes those who are married then cast rocks. And too often, it may be the case that their loneliness was there because we did not reach out and invite them into our families. The Bible says God sets the lonely in families. May our families bring in those who are feeling lonely that they may feel an emotional intimacy with us, a spiritual fellowship with us, each reaching to the other. In preparation for this message, I asked some people in our church who, who were single and some outside our church who have gone through much of life single and others who are married now but were single for much of their life. Give me your thoughts about singleness. What should I say to singles? What should I say to marrieds? Here's some things I heard. One man said this, what I would say to married people about single people, include them, ask them to lunch, invite them to watch the game with your family. They have a lot of alone time and they desire to be around other people in a non-dating atmosphere. People who are single by divorce can sometimes feel like failures, demoted to second string in the church. It makes them feel even more so if it feels like all the small groups, all the church gatherings are always geared toward couples. People who are divorced can feel ashamed, disqualified from serving in the church or unwanted. Look for ways to encourage them and pull them into areas of service that fit their gifts. And their gifts can be all kinds of gifts. And he said also, there's a distinction between setting me up with the incumbent pressures and awkwardness if it doesn't work out, or just creating opportunities for us to meet other single people. Most of us prefer the latter. One woman who was married for many years and then widowed and now is remarried shared this. There was an incredible sense of shame that I felt after being widowed. This breaks my heart. I often felt like I wore a scarlet W on my chest when I entered church. I wanted to get to my car as fast as possible so as not to be seen alone. I felt disqualified from ministry or like I had nothing to offer others. The loneliness was oppressive. Having had a good marriage and lost it, the loneliness was profound. Being around others, some who had never been married, I felt like I couldn't even talk about my loneliness because at least I had been married. And then I felt guilty about that. Marriage should not be held as the end all be all or that it completes you. I'm a valued child of God, single or married. And to the married, I would say, my identity is not wrapped up in my husband. I stand before the God, before the throne of God alone, Learn to love me alone. Such great insight. The scripture is what we base things on. Think about these scriptures about how we should live life in community with one another. And think about singles and marriage. Romans 12 says this. Share with God's people in need. Not just need financially, all kinds of need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Don't be conceited. And my observation is often singles have felt conceited in relation to marrieds, and marrieds sometimes can feel conceited in relation to singles. Put away the conceit. Humbly get to know one another. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. The body is a unit, though it's made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body, and so it is with Christ. And then Jesus, who was single his whole life, said this, who are my mother and my brothers, he said. He looked around to those seated in the circle around him, and he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The family of God, the family of God. What have we said so far? There's first of all calling, and that is God's gift. There is community, and that would be God's people. And now thirdly, we look at contentment, and that is God himself. God himself, our true and deepest contentment can only be found in God himself. You know, from time to time, my wife and I have to look at one another and remind ourselves, you know, God did not give you to me to satisfy the deepest needs of my heart. Only Jesus can do that. And the reason we're having tension right now is I'm wanting you to do something for me that only Jesus can do. There's some of you here who perhaps 
who are married, and frankly, you're just expecting too much of your marriage. God has never designed your marriage to give your heart what only Jesus can give your heart. And there are others of you here who are single, and you're expecting too much from your singleness, or you're putting too much stock in your hope of marriage. The reality is, you'll find what you're looking for in Jesus. Both of these things are callings, but neither of these things will satisfy your heart. Only Jesus can satisfy your heart and provide for you the contentment that you're looking for. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 73. Psalm 73 illustrates this. In Psalm 73, the psalmist looks at other people who are not following the Lord, and those people seem to have things that he wants that he doesn't have. And he's very tempted to throw away his faith and and chunk his belief altogether. But he comes into worship, which my friends is a good reason to keep worshiping with the people of God, even when you're doubting what God is all about. The writer of Psalm 73 comes into worship and there he comes to his senses and he sees the truth and he sees reality. And he sees that there's going to be the end of the story later for those who follow the Lord and those who don't. And he also makes this observation as he concludes the sermon, whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I really desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart. God is my portion, or God is my inheritance forever. He is my all in all. In Philippians 4, the Apostle Paul says much the same thing. He's really talking about money and about financial support in his life. He's had times of need and times of of wealth, so to speak. But here's his testimony. It could also apply to marriage. He said, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. For I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in, every, in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I asked for input here, as I said, about this message from some friends. And a lady in our church here, who I think is in her 50s and has never been married, gave me some of the most insightful things This is what she said, pertinent to this point. My singleness is not a mistake. I am not a mistake. I have been created for a purpose. And though I have not been chosen by some man out there, I have been chosen by God. And his love satisfies me. My friends, that is beautiful. You have been chosen by God. Allow yourself to drink deeply of his love and know that his love is what satisfies Sam Alberry makes this observation. I think it's so brilliant. He said, marriage shows us the shape of the gospel. Groom, bridegroom, husband, wife, Christ in the church. But singleness shows us the sufficiency of the gospel. I can have soul satisfaction if I'm not married. I can have soul satisfaction if I'm not sexually active. It was true for Jesus. It's been true for so many saints. It can be true for me the shape of the gospel, the sufficiency of the gospel. And marriage and singleness both preach that message loudly. My friends, if you look to any of these things as your primary identity, your calling, your soul satisfaction will never work. Drink in the love of Jesus. Live in community and follow the calling that God has given to you. Probably a great time for me to let you know the books that I would recommend that connect with the sermon. Last week, Jeff Jeff gave you about 12, and they're all great. I'm just going to give you three. This book by Sam Albury, Seven Myths About Singleness, is right on target with this topic and very insightful in so many ways. Another book by C.S. Lewis is called The Four Loves. He talks about affection, friendship, which is very pertinent here, erotic love, and agape. He also talks about love of country, love of all kinds of love. This book is so insightful to tell us not to overlove or underlove anything in creation. And it's very insightful, and it'll be insightful for you on all kinds of topics. I encourage you to get it and to read it. And then lastly, is a book by Rose Marie Miller called From Fear to Freedom. It's not about singleness or marriage at all, but it is totally about finding the freedom of the gospel every day in your life. If you are anchored in the gospel, you will be set, from, set free from fear and resentment and legalism and all kinds of things. 
And you will find your satisfaction in Jesus when you make the gospel the center of your heart. Let me end with a couple, of, a couple of observations here. Psalm 73 that I read from a few moments ago talks about the nearness of God. At the end of the psalm, the psalmist says, the nearness of God is my good. And some of us are tempted to think, no, it's the nearness of a spouse that will be good. But God says, it's the nearness of God that will be good for you. How do we find the nearness of God? It's through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have the nearness of God through the life and work and death and resurrection of a real man who was single his whole life. He lived a perfect life for us. He died a substitutionary death for our sins. He was raised to life for us. And all of that has happened so that by faith in him and repentance from sin, God will come near to us and we can be near to God. And that is how we find the nearness of God. There's another psalm, Psalm 139, that's uh, such a fabulous psalm. Someone that I've read who is single and who expects never to be married has said this psalm, Psalm 139, he comes back to again and again because it reminds him that God knows him, God loves him, God is with him, and there is a comforting presence of God that is there no matter what. I want to end our sermon today by asking you to stand as I read much of Psalm 139. Would you stand with me? You'll see it on the screen. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 18. I want you to consider the comforting presence and knowledge of God. He says, O oh Lord, you've searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down. You know when I rise up. You even perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my coming into the house to lie down. In fact, you're familiar, intimately familiar with all my ways. Even before there's a word on my tongue and I'm gonna say something, you know it completely before I say it, O oh Lord. You hem me in, you go before me, you're behind me. You have laid your hand over me. You're all around me. Then he says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too lofty for me to attain or even to understand. He's talking about the omnipresence and the omniscience and the presence of God in my life beyond my comprehension. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where could I flee from your presence if I wanted to flee? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my, de my bed in the depths of the sea, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, obviously to the east, you're there. If I settle in the far side of the sea, from Israel's perspective, that would be to the west. You're there. Even there, your hand will do what? It will guide me. Your right hand will hold on to me fast. Then he's afraid the darkness would be a problem. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, the light will become, will be, become night around me. But even the darkness will not be dark to you, Lord. The night will shine like the day. For darkness is the same thing as light to you. And then he reflects on his creation. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths. Your eye saw my unforced substance. In other words, who you are physically by birth is not an accident. It has been designed by God. And then he says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Would you believe that, please? There has not been one day of your life that has been an accident. Every day has been ordained by God. Then he says, how precious to me are your thoughts, O Lord. The Hebrew could say, could be translated, how precious are your thoughts about me, O Lord? How vast is the sum of them? Were I to count them, how often you think of me, those thoughts would outnumber the grains of sand. He thinks about you that much. And when I wake, I am still where? I am still with you. Let me say to those who have the aching loneliness when you go to bed or the aching loneliness when you wake up, God is still with you. And you are still with him every night when you go to bed, every morning when you get up. The nearness of God is your good, whether single or married. And that nearness comes through the work of Jesus Christ. All praise to him. Let's pray as we close.
Oh, Lord Jesus, we do thank you and we praise you that it has been your work that has brought the Father close to us and that takes us close to the Father. May we always choose your nearness to be the good of our hearts. May we find our contentment alone in you. May we live intimately in the community of your people. And may we live according to our calling, that whether single or married, we would leverage our singleness, we would leverage our marriages to serve other people, to serve this needy world, and to serve the body of Christ. We pray it all in Jesus' name, amen.